I'm back. This is the first day in three months I've put on makeup, that I've done my hair, and I wore real clothes for more than an hour. So I'm happy to be with you all this morning. Um, our newest daughter is in the nursery with Cora crying, so I'm really happy to be with you all this morning. Hopefully she's asleep soon. I have just a few announcements. Also, I'd like to call out my husband, who thinks I forgot how to be a pastor in three months. He was whispering in my ear how to do things. And I looked at him and I said, I know how to do this. In a few weeks, we have VBS here. Um, it is a food truck theme. Greg Carter is out of town, so I will be doing my best to step into his role as the fun character in the mornings. If you are interested in volunteering or know someone that wants to sign up to participate, we would love to have you or them involved that week. It should be a really fun week. We had a blast last year, and so uh, it was an easy decision to do it again this year. We have a fun summer series coming up. It's a Pixar sermon series. That means those cute Pixar movies, for example, Toy Story was one. We're going to base some sermons on those movies. We're not saying those movies are Christian, but we're gonna let them inspire us a little bit and connect them to some scripture. There are two nights that um, we're actually even gonna have a movie showing because we've tried to pick some of the newer ones just in case you haven't seen them that we'll preach on and we'll do a Sunday school related to. So just like, uh, was it last year we did the Dr. Seuss or was that two years ago? Who, who knows? But just like we did Dr. Seuss inspired sermons, this one we Pixar movie inspired sermons and that is coming up shortly. Um, Saeed Abib, who is the father of our Afghan refugee family, needs employment. So we're reaching out to you all to see if you have heard of any kind of employment that requires little to no English, let us know. So he is uh, working and trying to find a job. So if you know of any job that requires little to no English, please reach out to John and I, and we will try to see if Saeed Abib would fit there. On the topic of the Mohammadi family, <clears throat> I found out that John did not tell you all the update that the youngest Mohammadi, Mustafa, Saeed Mustafa, um, who had brain surgery a month ago, it went well. He forgot to give you all an update and he just remembered that. So he wanted me to share with you all and thank you for your prayers. He's going for a checkup this Tuesday um, in Kansas City to make sure everything really is okay. But I've seen him and he looks great. So thank you for those prayers. Those are our announcements for now. So now if you will please join me in the call to worship. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you all. God is light. God is love. God is spirit. Please join me in singing Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, number 356 in your blue hymnals.
friends I spoke too soon. I forgot to remind you all that it is communion. So if you did not, feel free to sneak out at any moment and grab one of those little cups that have juice and the wafer on top, and we will partake in communion later in the worship. Now, most holy God in Christ Jesus, you have shown us a light and love which is overwhelming. As we worship you, let us be frightened by your glory, but enraptured with your love. Let us now confess together our sin to one another and to you, Lord. Holy friend, God and Savior, please deal with us, not as we would like, but as we truly need. Bring us to self-honesty, to recognize what is good, to admit what is evil. Enable us to sincerely repent of both our blatant sins and our secret ones. Do not allow us any self-pity or wallowing in guilt, but help us to turn to you for forgiveness and cleansing. Encourage us to accept that new begin are mend the wrong done to others. We cannot put things right Give us the humility to pray for those who can. By your abundant grace, bring goodness out of evil, success out of failure. Friends, remember that if your conscience wants to keep on condemning you, God is even greater than your conscience and knows and forgives all. In Christ, perfect love casts out fear. Do not worry and be at peace, for you are forgiven and loved just as you are. The peace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. may be seated. Our first reading today comes from the book of Deuteronomy. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Now this is the commandment, the statues and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you and so that you might multiply greatly in the lands flowing with milk and honey as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord.
Our second scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22. The same day, some Sadducees came to him saying, there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question. Teacher Moses said, if a man dies childless, his brother shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died childless, leaving the widow to his brother. The second did the same, so also the third, down unto the seventh. Last of all, the woman herself died. In the resurrection, then, whose wife of the seven will she be? For all of them had married her. Jesus answered them, You are wrong because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, people neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is God not of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowds heard it, they were astounded at his teaching. Will you please join me in a word of prayer? Lord, this morning we ask that we too would hear your word and like the crowds gathered, that we would be astounded by it, that it would take root in our lives and continue to grow and blossom, providing not only shade but fruit for all who we encounter. Pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Well, good morning. This is not my normal time to get to more, say, excuse me, good morning. I usually get to say it a little earlier, but someone decided to come back, so I had to wait a few minutes. However, I was fortunate enough that as I walked around in the halls, I already heard a few comments on my lovely attire this morning. It makes me look rather dandy and patriotic, if I do say so myself. Except it doesn't. You see, I stand here before you in violation of the United States flag code. Section 8, subpoint D. The flag should never be used as wearing apparel, bedding, or drapery. I would actually imagine that many of you are just as guilty as I am. Maybe not because of your attire this morning, but if you keep reading, subpoint I of section 8 goes on to state, the flag should never be used for advertising purposes in any manner whatsoever. It should never be embroidered on articles such as cushions or handkerchiefs and the like, printed or otherwise, should not be impressed on paper napkins. 
or boxes or anything that is designed for temporary use and discard. Well, what are we going to do at all of our 4th of July picnics if we can't have American flag napkins? A hot dog that's been char-grilled. It just doesn't taste as good unless you've got old glory to wrap around it and prevent some of those ketchup and mustard stains. And I could have used an American flag napkin a minute ago because I spilled tea on myself. As you might be able to tell, I had a little bit of fun this week while I was researching the flag code in preparation for this sermon. I knew that I could use it to make a point or two. The whole thing's only five pages long. It doesn't take that long to read, but there were a few points that stood out to me. For example, did you know how disrespectful the NFL is in regard to the flag? Every game, they're out there spreading that giant flag across the field, but according to the flag code, the flag should never be carried horizontally, but always aloft and free. Is that where you were expecting me to go with that statement? I doubt it. Even though the Black Lives Matter protests and the stories about athletes kneeling during the anthem are not really the center of the news cycle anymore, they certainly were for a while. There was quite a large uproar at one point in time. Well, as it turns out, because of my research, I can assure you that there is no prohibition of kneeling during the national anthem in the flag code. In fact, there is no mention of the national anthem at all in the flag code. Now, I'm not going to delve any deeper into this can of worms. You can, if you want, acknowledge the purpose behind the actions that were taken by these individuals who chose to kneel, or you can take personal offense to the means by which they have chosen to make their protest and use their voices. That's up to you, and it's not the sermon that I'm delivering this morning. Instead, I'm about to, relatively soon, pivot our conversation away from the U.S. flag code and back to the Bible. Because I already know that a number of you happen to know the flag code fairly well. I was actually very kindly, thank you for doing this kindly, kindly approached and told one time that we had our flags on the wrong side of the room in here and we had to switch them. But how is our knowledge of the Bible? I mean, yeah, we have a very basic and maybe even very complicated level of familiarity with it, but how many of our decisions, how many of our beliefs are based upon things that we believe to be in the Bible, but aren't actually there? So today we're going to talk a little bit about what people know, what people believe about what they know, and how people are sometimes so confident in what they believe about what they know, even though they might know relatively little. Let's start with an example. We all know that we should be following the Ten Commandments. Every one of our confirmands as they went through the class, mentioned the importance of the Ten Commandments to them. How they desired that they should serve as guideposts around which they want to live their lives. But while they made these affirmations, not many of them could sit down and list all Ten Commandments. And I'm imagining not all of us could sit down and list all Ten Commandments. Maybe, for some of us, those of us who have spent a majority of our lives in church, you could sit down, and if given 
ample time and pen and paper, you could write down nine, perhaps even ten of them, but maybe eight. You'd be sitting there, certainly frustrated, trying to come up with the last one or two. Some of you might be able to get half. Some of you might be able to get one. And that's fine. This is not any condemnation, condemnation uh, of folks who, who don't have the Ten Commandments memorized. You're not a bad Christian. You're not a bad person for not carrying them around on a little index card in your purse or your wallet. And see, so what I'm trying to do is get across the point that these commandments, they are considered to be absolutely pillars of our faith something that we all point to as being absolutely foundational. And we probably don't even know what all of them are. I mean, if you're going to affirm them, shouldn't we be intimately familiar with them? Now, here's my moment of honesty. I would not have been able to pass the Ten Commandments quiz as recently as my first year in seminary, until we were told that naming them all in order might be a question on the final. Luckily, I had a classmate and a good friend who grew up in, in a more uh, fundamental, uh, biblically uh, literal kind of uh, institution. He went to a camp where they, they focused on this kind of memorization, and he taught us a little set of hand gestures to help us count and remember these Ten Commandments. The Lord your God is one. That's easy enough. Number two, don't make any idols. See, this looks like a little person. It's also the number two. That's a graven image right there. Don't take the Lord's name in vain is number three. If you look at your hand, this makes an L, and that makes a V. Lord's name in vain, number three. Got it? Number four is honor the Sabbath. This is a little person laying in their hammock. Number five is honor thy mother and father. Number six, I always say don't shoot anyone, although that's not how it's written. See six fingers right here? Don't kill. Number seven, no hanky-panky. These are two people in a bed. <laughs> Number eight is don't steal anything or you go to jail. This is you behind bars. Number nine is do not bear false witness. There's five people over here in a crowd. This thumb, it's not up, so don't count it, but it's talking to these four about these other five. Don't bear false witness. Number ten is don't covet. If you're tempted to reach out and grab something or, or take, you know, you're greedy. Don't covet all ten of your fingers you used to grab. So not surprisingly, these ten commandments, which we really consider to be essential to our faith, well, they were deemed pretty valuable to the community who first received them. Moses, he initially delivers these ten commandments when he comes down from Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 20. But in Deuteronomy, like we read today, Moses stands before the convened nation, the, all of the population of the Hebrew people once again, and he reminds them how they got to this place in time, how God has delivered them, but he also reminds them of what is going to be expected of them when they move into the promised land. As a part of this recapitulation, he repeats these Ten Commandments in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, which is followed directly after by, well, chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, which we read today. And in that passage, if you will recall, he says, keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are away. When you lie down and when you rise, bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, Write them down on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And after reading that, I'm feeling like maybe I should be taking back my statement about it being okay that we don't all carry around index cards with the Ten Commandments written in them in our wallet or purse. But no, I don't actually think that's the problem. Yes, we should be familiar with God's commandments especially the greatest commandment of all, which is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and might. 
But I think that the real problem occurs when we convince ourselves that whatever knowledge we do possess of Scripture is enough to make us authorities. When we believe that because of what we know about the Bible and God, we have the right to critique and condemn, then we're in trouble. This is a problem that stems from believing that we know more than we actually do. There's a a fancy term for this. It's it's a really relatively common occurrence. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's a form of cognitive bias beyond just the scope of Christianity, but in which people with a a rather low uh, ability or or expertise or experience with regard to a, a certain type of task or area of knowledge, they actually tend to overestimate their ability or knowledge. Essentially, the, the lower a person's competence, the larger the gap is, on average, between their assessment of their confidence and their actual level of confidence. Or, as William Shakespeare once wrote, the fool doth think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. Now, I'm not pointing any of my fingers at anyone here specifically. In fact, I think I have seen very little to none of this kind of behavior at all in this congregation. But on a much broader scale, I think that this is a problem that is fairly pervasive throughout Christianity. Time and time again, I have seen people define themselves as standing contrary to a particular hot-button issue, whatever it may be, and using their faith as justification. More often than not, it seems that then these beliefs are followed by this expectation that others, be they Christian or not, should adhere to them as well. The problem with this is that, that many times these beliefs that are turned into mandates are either completely uh, misconstrued regarding any kind of biblical origin or they appear nowhere in the Bible at all. Instead, they're based loosely on preconceived ideas which people construe as being in line with religion, and then they become falsely attributed. Think, if you will, beyond even just our current situation. Think of every time that religion has been used to justify violence and abuse. Think of the atrocities of the Crusades from which we are so far removed now, but had obviously an immediate and gruesome impact in the lives of thousands of people. When sermons were delivered to gathered armies of men, exhorting them to kill as an act of love, thus ending their terrible enemy's life, their sinful life, allowing them to somehow be freed from that captivity and being permitted to meet the true God. Think of the circuit-riding pastors who were hired by plantation owners to come and preach the exact same select verses every time. The ones from Ephesians chapter 6, Colossians chapter 3, 1 Timothy 6, Titus 2, all of which say that slaves are to be obedient to their masters. I think that it it probably all stems from fear. The fear of being wrong. 
in response to growing protests and opposition, it's easy to turn to something that is seemingly unshakable. Because if a person can perform the, the mental juggling act that is necessary to align something that is as large and institutional as organized religion, if they can align that with their own ideals, then there's no way that they can be incorrect without Christianity itself being incorrect. That's a reassuring support structure for someone who cares more about being right than they care about listening to other people's perspectives and needs. All they have to do then is lean on the much bigger establishment and allow it to do their thinking for them, or worse, they slap on whatever thoughts they have to this powerful framework and claim that it was always there. Jesus says, you can't do that. Some Sadducees, they came to Jesus with a question that they had prepared, a trap to disprove his authority. The problem is that they focus on the semantics, the logistics. They act as if the Bible provides some kind of detailed, specific answer for every possible scenario in life. And rather than attempting to read, interpret, and live the heart of the law, they get caught up debating the letter of the law. The Sadducees, they pose their absurd question ready for this aha, gotcha kind of moment, only to be told that they are completely wrong. They're wrong for even asking because they know not the Scriptures or the power of God. If anything, I think that these religious experts, they have the problem of being blinded. Blinded by being overly knowledgeable and too intimately familiar with Scripture in this instance, instead of stepping back and noticing the big picture. Instead of caring about the things that God cares about, they get caught up and lost in the minutia and the loopholes, and they think that uh, a clever little trick is going to somehow prove that a person has no authority whatsoever in regards to the entirety of Scripture. It's almost like they can't see the forest for the trees. And through their little justifications and tricks, they believe that they have constructed a foolproof argument. Just like the circuit-riding, slavery-promoting pastors had convinced themselves. I would even go so far as to say, that I'm guilty of doing a very similar thing just this morning, intentionally presenting only the convenient little quotes from the United States flag code that helped me illustrate a point. I didn't read it to you verbatim. I didn't sit here and try to do my best to faithfully and accurately represent the idea that is contained within and between and behind the lines of text. You cannot simply cherry-pick scriptures and use them to make your case regarding the entirety of scripture. Well, can you? Flashback now to our first reading from Deuteronomy chapter 6, which conveniently comes right after the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5, and within it is the single greatest commandment. A commandment which Jesus conveniently is about to reference just four verses after our second reading for this morning. Just after the Sadducees approach him, Jesus does his own little cherry-picking of Scripture. When he's asked what the greatest commandment is, this wise and spiritually acquainted fellow, 
he reminds his audience that it is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, but goes on to report that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. And here's the really good part. The really good part. Upon these two commandments, not ten, hang all the law and the prophets. Two, that's not too bad. That's really not too much to know. The problem is that knowing these commandments and understanding what it means to live by them are two entirely different things. And you know what? That's okay. It's okay to say, yeah, we've got this first form of knowing kind of figured out. I I know what those two commandments are. And it's okay to say, I'm still working on the second part of it. I still get it wrong on occasion, knowing what it means to live that out in my life. And you know what? It's not a bad thing to be wrong every once in a while. I don't just mean admitting when we've done something wrong, when we've made a a mistake. I think it's a little easier to admit that, to dismiss them as rather singular, one-off kind of occasions, things that don't define us, just mistakes. But we can do more than that, right? We can admit that we have incorrect understandings. We have incorrect beliefs, assumptions, convictions, and even principles. Because believe me, all of us have changed our mind a time or two at some point in our lives. And it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that, that you should feel shame for being wrong. It means that you're learning and, and growing. It means you're listening. It means you're falling in line with the will of God. And it may mean that you even understand a little bit more about Scripture than you think you do. Amen. I invite you to join with me now as we affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you also now to join with us as we sing together hymn number 106, Alleluia, give thanks.
friends, this is not my table. This is not just First Presbyterian Church of Joplin's table. This table does not belong to the Presbyterian Church USA alone. This is not Americans only table. This table is not reserved only for the wealthy or well connected. This table is for all. This table is for sinners, for the poor, for those who are cast out, for those who are hungry and thirst. This table is reserved for you, me, and everyone that God loves. This table is Jesus Christ's table. Come eat. And it's okay if you need to go get your communion cup. Let us pray. When we are, wait, Lord, blessed are we. For you created the world, loved each of us, created male, female, friends, neighbors, enemies. Lord, we thank you for this creation, for the freedoms that we do have. We thank you for the love that you've given for each of us, just as we are. Lord, at times we know we have strayed from this love, and we pray for your guidance to bring us back on the path, and to help guide others. Lord, when we are weak, please make us strong. Lord, help us to see our neighbors that are in need of love and care. Guide our actions and thoughts and deeds. Lord, we know we are commanded to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, in action and deed. But sometimes we are weary, weary from the day to day, weary from the news, weary from the injustices. Inspire us, Lord. We come here to the table to be nourished and fed. May this time build us up, inspire us to keep fighting. Lord, when we are tempted to keep silent in the face of injustice, give us courage to speak out. When we would prefer to explain things away, give us courage to see what you would have us see. When we are on the cups of giving in to our own ideas about you, reveal your true self to us again in the breaking of bread and nourish us in the life of your spirit. Lord, maybe not everyone knows, but the General Assembly has been meeting in our denomination. Our very own Tony Spieth has been there representing our presbytery. Lord, we pray for all those leaders and representatives that are coming together to decide big decisions and find the best way for our denomination to represent you in the world, Lord. We also pray for safe travel, especially when travel sounds to be very stressful right now, Lord. Lord, you know the names that are on our hearts that we have lifted up to you. I specifically want to lift up Jennifer James to you, Lord, as she heals in Mercy Hospital. Lord, please be with Jennifer and let her feel your encompassing love. We also lift up her family as they make some big decisions and as Jennifer adjusts to the next days. 
Lord, here at your feast of life, we break bread with people who have known heartache, with people who have caused it, and join together in praying for your will to be done, not ours. As we come to your table surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, flawed and faithful, each in our own ways, remake us into your body yet again, loving, serving, and caring for the world. We pray these and all things in the name of the one who proves your faithfulness, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us to evil. For now is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord. Let us pray. God of glory, in this holy meal, you show us your will for every meal. In Christ's strength, let us live and work for the day when all tables are filled with your abundance, and surrounded by your people in peace and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now is the time where I remind you all to continue to give in support of all the amazing things that this church does. I also want to take a moment and thank you for giving me the time to spend the last three months with my new baby girl, Lillian, as my big baby girl crawled down on Jane. It is a time that is exhausting and beautiful and not a vacation, <laughs> but I would not uh, take it back for a moment. And it is not lost on me that three months is a lot more than most people get. Uh, I know it's much more than many of you got, and I really appreciate that time that I got to spend with Lillian. So. Thank you for your support and kindness, for your kind words, for your many gifts, because I lost my list to write you thank you notes. So thank you. But you all are so kind, and I'm so excited that Lillian is a part of this family. I know she will be loved on here, and um, we'll get to know all of you as the years keep coming. So thank you for that. Now, we do not pass plates, as you all know, 
But there's a box in the narthex, and you can give online or you can write checks and mail them to us. Whatever you do, you do it well. I know that this is an amazing giving church. So thank you. And remember uh, to continue to give just as Jesus Christ has given for each of us. Let us close worship with a hymn 564. The choir will be singing some verses, and we are invited to join on verse 4, right? Yeah. Okay. No matter how much you might know, 
you don't know it all, don't pretend like you do. Go forth from this place with the bravery and the courage to admit I'm wrong and be willing to admit it over and over again. Only that way, together, will we grow. Go now in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.